or you prefer to wait a couple of minutes? I'm fine, you know, and uh, I prefer to start because I okay, wrote so... three in an hour. <laughs> good, good. Okay, then, yeah, let me just <laughs> introduce you and maybe, yeah, let's. Let me just say, okay, let, we're gonna start. We are very pleased to have Jan Sanen today from uh, Institute Lawrence and University of Leiden. I don't think uh, Jan needs introduction in this community or in, in many communities, so I won't uh, do it. Just let me say that this is officially the first seminar of this Holotube initiative that we are starting that hopefully we'll have many more. Well, we already have many more planned and this, the next one is on Friday at 10, 10 a.m. European Central European time, and with all uh, with all that said, just let me before uh, giving the giving the floor to Jan, just let's say that everybody is muted by default, but you can all unmute yourselves when you want to ask a question. So just please do it uh, whenever you want. Uh, unmute yourself and ask a question. If you are having troubles you can also try to chat to me uh, privately saying what the problem is but i think everything should be smooth so with with that said let's 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 start so jan will talk us about holography in the in the lab and he will tell us whether the killer apps are around the corner or not so please jan whenever you want thanks daniel uh it's kind of weird it's the first virtual seminar that i'm giving and I don't quite trust it, you know, I think that uh, we are people, right? We are animals and we have to really see each other and especially also smell each other. You have to smell all the fear in my sweat in order to really appreciate the talk. But anyhow, I will try to try to do my best in this comfort zone of my study. Um, good. Uh, everybody's welcome. Um, this is supposed to be a bit uh, of a shot in the arm for everybody. Uh, sitting in your uh, COVID uh, isolation, you might may think, that life's coming to an end, but actually there's a lot of life. Um, so what is it about? Uh, wait a moment, why is this not working? Uh, uh, here. Yes, that's working. Yeah, uh, so let me explain the uh, title. I just kill her app thing. Um, actually, that word uh, came to me in 2016 when uh, David Gross was visiting Leiden, uh, kind of Francis David. Um, and you may know that David was, uh, when ADSMT was rich, he was kind of skeptical about it. At the point he started to apologize to the matter people that think theorists were exaggerating the claims. Now, but the sort of basic deal of uh, David is, and I completely agree with that, that when you just play your theoretical games, it's not really serious. At the moment you manage to lend your serious, your serious games on the lab floor, it starts to talk to nature proper, and that nature proper you meet on the floor, not behind the blackboard. You can get a, get a different game park. It gets very serious. It gets business, right? And David was basically insisting someone should take the responsibility to try to carry uh, the uh, uh, holographic wisdoms to the laboratory. Now, my role has been actually always kind of been the, the intermediate, intermediary person. Uh, frankly, I perceive not real difference between fancy experimentalists uh, driving their extremely complicated machines and you guys driving these pretty complicated mathematical machines, right? And I chose my role to just bring it together and try to land a single of David where holography is, would turn into really a big business. Now, the bottom line is that um, mostly because of all the serendipitous developments of, on the lab floor, this ballpark is really changing. Um, it is getting serious. Experimentalists start to listen to the uh, holographic messages. And more than that, when you have a holography you have, you really mean now something on the laboratory floor, at least I do. And this is a story I want to get across, you know, and basically this outlook that in a year from now or something, it could well be that suddenly holography is an extremely big deal uh, in the commerce matter in the community. It could happen. Likely it will take more time than that, but it's really going into the right direction. I'm very excited about it. So I will start out with sort of a reminder. I have a view on what all this holography is about from a commerce matter uh, viewpoint. And it makes me feel very comfortable. I really like it telling me stuff that I want to know, and I kind of know what it is, not everything, but at least pieces of it. 
uh, and it's really about common supremacy. It's about a thing uh, that uh, 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 is now a big deal in the uh, uh, community building. The quantum computer is basically the same thing, and I will explain it. And then it comes to, let's call it the killer app candidates. Um, and I've actually, it's, it's going so fast that I have too many subjects now. I cannot quite pack it in an hour, all the uh, excitement. Uh, so this uh, linear stiffness thing has been uh, going on for a while now. Those people that were in line in January uh, may have heard my talk, which is sort of big uh, surprise coming from, uh, from uh, Mr. Hein, uh, from the, the Caffeine uh, Nobel Prize laureate, but I decided to just skip it. Uh, in a way, it's the most tricky proposition uh, on hologenity. These other things are in a way more um, solid. It's about a very big surprise. You see my pointer, right? Um, uh, ab about, uh, uh, that happened when I was in Stanford on sabbatical uh, as related to photo emission. Um, then perhaps the thing that is closest to uh, holography uh, of all, which is about, um, in essence, seeing the quantum critical sector at work uh, in your face when you uh, are in the unlikely uh, 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 area of spin stripes in uh, cuprates. And then I will um, tell you a very new story, I just broke the uh, paper submitted last week to science, about extremely weird things that are happening in the overdose phase, where the relationship with uh, holography is not so clear yet. It's more like you know a challenge for you guys to think hard about it and see whether you can shed light on it using black holes. I have a good feeling they really need black holes, but they don't fit quite yet. But keep your eyes open. It's really a homework uh, 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 story. Good. So let me start out with selling my view on holography. Right, so we are living in this era of the quantum computer that's now around the corner. And I don't know how it worked with you guys, but for me, I'm getting an old man, it was nevertheless a quite a revealing type of thing. Right? Uh, it's basically about using information language in physics, that's the bottom line. And when you uh, use information uh, language, some things that should have been uh, completely obvious all along, suddenly become obvious. Um, so what is it about? It's all about, let's call it constant supremacy. So we have two qubits, you have a Hilbert space spent up by the uh, four configurations, so the dimension of Hilbert space is four, right? And then uh, uh, you take a particular period of position, like uh, zero, one, and one, zero, and then you decide that this is a bell pair, it's maximally entangled, and then you discover that entanglement is the essence of quantum physics, and it can particularly clear to you uh, in a, a in a, in a way to you that's very clear um, when you think information questions, right? So, so an entangled pair is a uh, uh, computational resource. You can use it to make a better computer. Now you go to three bits and your Hilbert space already exposed to eight is two cubed. And actually to uh, precisely take apart a, uh, a triple in terms of you know, classification of entanglement, it turns out to be very hard to work. I've seen a claim that can be precisely uh, classified, but it's actually pretty complicated. I'm not sure that I really understand it. Now we go to reality. Reality is made out of uh, quantum bits. It's all about quantum physics. A uh, program of matter, uh, 10 to the power 23 of these qubits, more or less. Meaning that the Hilbert space dimension is as large as 2 to the power, 10 to the power 23. So typical states will be uh, coherence of positions involving that whole big Hilbert space, right? Typical states will be delocalized in an enormously large Hilbert space of 2 to the power, 10 to the power 23. And then you can wonder how can it be that we can make any sense out of reality? We are supposed to be drowned completely in this uh, information mathematical complexity uh, of these typical quantum states that we encounter as uh, microscopic beings. Now the answer is, it's sort of pending uh, what kind of question you ask, but we have all the time answers for it. Uh, so the, perhaps the most important question you can ask to nature is what is matter? What do you mean with matter, right? And they discover that we have actually been brainwashed by our textbooks and our energy physics and the condensed metaphysics because uh, 
the uh, guys that we have learned and the physics that is resting on, on this vacua, vacua is actually very special. It's a kind of a cherry picking thing. And the bottom line is that the vacua that we learned in school are a special kind, they're called short range and tangled product states. How does it work? It's very simple. Take a table, and all of us know how we make tables out of quantum physics. You uh, make an array of real space wave packets, uh, uh, and then you plug an atom in every uh, real space wave packet, and that's your table, right? And the wave function is obviously a product state. It's more the equivalent to a classical bit string in a quantum computer. The not all story because now you have to uh, do uh, diagrams. You have to consider the uh, 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 converging perturbations here around this ansatz, uh, and causing things like zero point motion and force. But that's a polynomial exercise, right? So some of the diagrams, uh, 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 when uh, you're dealing with this uh, form of matter, it will converge. It really means that entanglement only occurs locally. Right, so you zoom out and there's some scale where all entanglement is vanishing when you arrive at the microscopic scale. You are dealing with classical matter because there's no longer knowledge of entanglement. It basically works for anything. Uh, uh, and a good example is the BCS state. That's very obviously a product. Um, it's even true for the Fermi liquid. Right, so we tend to think about it as something which is really different, but at the end of the day, is a short range and tangled product state. In that sense, the Fermi liquid is a classical state of matter. It sounds kind of strange, but it's equally true. Now, you can now ask the question, is, is it a law that all vacuum, vacuum states are of the short range and tangled vacuum kind, meaning microscopic matter is always classical? And that's basically this pursuit that has been in the heads of condensed matter theorists in the last so many years. We have learned about topological order, and it happens in an incompressible matter. So you can't say it is separated by all excitation by a big energy gap. And so again, when already explained in 1992, that is topological properties you get can be looked at as uh, there's still a very sparse form of many body entanglement. That's very sparse, you have to realize that for every topological uh, quantum bit you make, you need, an, an, in principle, an infinite amount of microscopic bits. Right? So that, that's a kind of understand in the meantime. When you go to compressible matter, there's no energy gap. We basically don't know anything. Right? So your guns that get now typical, they are delocalized in a very, very big Hilbert space, and these states of matter should do physics, and then you ask the question, well, is it physics? And we know very little about it, and that has been moving. Right, so we know since the, uh, at least Condensed Matters, the physics since the early 90s, that these strongly interacting CFTs, such deviant quantum critical states, are of this kind. They are what I like to call constantly matter. And only is it coming uh, with uh, especially the ADS CFT machinery that we learned more about how this stuff can behave as a physical substance. Okay, so. Uh, why should we worry about this in the context of condensed matter physics? The um, reason is that we usually worry about electrons and electron fermions, and when they're strongly intacted and they occur at a finer density, you win into that famous or infamous uh, sign problem. Right? And you may know about this uh, claim that, that, that you can prove that the generic vacuum state of a sign for problem is actually MP hard. That is this Troy Weiss uh, uh, paper, you don't know it. Look it up, it's the most cited paper, I think, by uh, Matthias Troyer. Uh, so when you have science, you have no longer this map onto uh, stochastic uh, physics of the kind uh, that, that was developed by the statistical physicists, where you basically with this one color, you can get anywhere. Um, and the bottom line is when you have a fermion sign problem, it's serious. Uh, we don't really know what to think. Right? So that is a resource, actually, to believe that these states of concept supreme matter may exist. Now, this has basically been hitting us in the face for the last 30 years, condensed matter physics, right? Everything uh, seemed to be settled. We seemed to understand any, everything in the mid-1980s. And then how this issue conductivity came. And it was um, extremely uh, precisely uh, 
investigated using experimental means over the last 30, 40 years. And the research that's still going is that every time, you know, you uh, try out a new experiment, again, you find surprises, things nobody expects. Um, at the same time, when ITC was fresh, I'm old enough to have uh, witnessed that era, when you had a big meeting, uh, there could have been a plenary session, and in the early days of ITC, there were these meetings, it was like 5,000 people, but then the plenary session was 5,000 people, and it was always a majority of theorists, like Phil Anderson, etc., were giving their talks on what they thought was going on. When you go nowadays to an ITC meeting, there's basically no theorist at all in a plenary session for the simple reason that the theorists failed extremely badly. They, they didn't you know, managed to get any equation to work that was really shedding light on the thing that's going on there. At the same time, the, the problem is crying out for mathematical language, right? And apparently we didn't quite have the uh, mathematical language, so that's what's going on here. Okay, this is about strongly interacting fermions at a finite density, and you're just staring at the sign problem. I have no doubt about it. There's like many of my friends think precisely the same way about it, right? You are forced to think this way after... 30 something years of uh, 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 powerless uh, thought. Okay, now I would like to do this shortly why I'm rather convinced that ADS-CFT is addressing this densely intended, call it consequent matter. That's a little secret of uh, this whole affair. Uh, this is still a bit conjectural, and we are actually planning to give it a much more sort of test, but it's really about the meaning of that large n limit, right? We don't like it because large n is very uh, remote from anything from the UV incondensed matter physics. But actually, there's something to it that we should like a lot. So uh, I learned this from uh, Grieve Vidal, that's the guy who figured out his uh, Amira uh, hierarchical uh, tensor networks. And uh, uh, Grieve was fooling around with uh, one plus one dimensional series, and he figured out that uh, when you unleash your mirror on a C of T with a conformal charge C, that actually the uh, bond dimension you have to maintain in order to keep the uh, accuracy the same is growing exponentially with central charge, right? So central charge goes like N squared. And the bottom line is that when the central charge is growing, at least in terms of the operators that are accessible to you, uh, the, the uh, 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 entanglement density, the, the, the exponential uh, complexity is actually growing is the central charge. So central charge is just a great way to uh, uh, wire in more and more dense entanglements in a CFT in one plus one dimensions. Should be true in higher dimension, now it comes. So you start out in ADS CFT with a zero density state that's made out of this CFT at the very large central charge and very strong coupling. And then you start to fool around with it like you push it to a finer density. Your building material is obviously already very densely entangled. You go to a finer density. Surely ADS CFT knows about the sign problem. I'm going to wait a second until it becomes clear. Right? So you make automatically sort of fermionic matter just as densely entangled as you perhaps can imagine uh, uh, using physical means. In other words, ads -CFT, I read as, it describes a class of systems that is in a maximally entanglement limit of some kind, and maybe many, many uh, uh, of these limits we just don't know. And uh, now you can ask the question, is this a limit uh, when you look in the IR? Actually, a representative for uh, what is happening in the cupids when you look at the physics of it, at, at the phenomenology. Right? It's a bit like you get a Fermi liquid when you start out with a Fermi gas, then you can make it very strongly interacting, but it will normalize to a Fermi gas again with uh, weirdly uh, massive uh, class of particles. But you can use that Fermi liquid to address the long wavelength physics, the strong emergent physics of your uh, electron system. I'm claiming that ADS CFT is basically doing the same thing. So these other gravitational metals and all of it is just like. This, this, this limiting case, and then it's just a question. Is the physical system getting close enough to that limit so that that limiting case is uh, actually of use? And there I am actually optimistic. 
because area safety uh, is in a way very reasonable in its, uh, you know, universal predictions. We don't look, come and look at details that can be very UV dependent. So one of these eye openers from my perspective uh, was this explanation uh, by Blaze and Elias um, that in a deep infrared, you're dealing with a particular type of scanning behavior. Uh, right, so uh, the clouds basically like you start with EMD cavity, and then you can map the near horizon geometry of these black hole objects that you can form. And these are rather universal from a gravitational perspective. And you look at the metric, you can translate that in scanning behavior in the uh, boundary field scene. And what you find is kind of a column of scaling, there's a big uh, uh, warp in it, uh, telling us that uh, you can grab the scaling behavior of these uh, uh, metallic states of matter in terms of uh, three exponent, there's a dynamic critical exponent telling how space and time relate to each other under uh, scaling. There's a hyperscaling violation exponent telling you how the uh, number of, of, of thermodynamically relevant uh, degrees of freedom uh, 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 relate to the dimensionality of your system. And there's this charge exponent that will largely ignore because I find it spooky. In kind of a later stage, I started to realize that we actually kind of know about it, this kind of scaling behavior, and that we should be eager to see how this known case is generalized by uh, holography. The bottom line is uh, that you better think that these holographic strange metals are generalizations of a Fermi liquid. They're not generalizations of some, uh, you know, zero density quantum critical state or anything of the kind. Some people think that, but it's absolutely wrong. So the Fermi liquid is kind of an interesting piece because, yeah, okay, it is a uh, particle physics state, uh, but um, as a phase of matter, it's showing all the time scaling behavior, all physical responses are algebraic. Right, so you know about the T squared resistivity. There's a sum of felt specific heat, right? Uh, entropy goes like uh, temperature itself, and so forth. But there's quite a bit more structure in the Fermi liquid, and that you get to see when you look at the charge excitation spectrum or the current uh, excitation of matter, really, it all hangs together. That is basically built from uh, this famous uh, diagram, where on the one hand, you have all these electron hole pair excitations of the Fermi cell spinning up this thing called the Lindhardt continuum. Then, uh, when you have a realistic Fermi liquid that's always interacting, you always will split off a collective mode called zero sound. Right? And zero sound is basically like uh, when you have repulsive interactions, your Fermi cell sort of hardens up in the hard membrane, you kick it and it breathes like a soccer ball. Then there's a little bit volume see him saying that the volume enclosed by the Fermi surface is directly set by the microscopic uh, density of particles, and for you modulate uh, that uh, particle density as well, and you get a sound mode. Uh, so actually, when you look at the uh, conductivity or the polarization, polarizability, it's matter, it's all the same, and you go to a finite momentum, it's actually like a two fluid system. You have on the one hand, the sound mode, that because it's finite momentum, also hydrodynamic and all of that. And in addition, you have these other excitations that are basically branch cutish. They do actually scale. Right? So when you look at the uh, uh, conductivity associated with the little continuum at the final moment, you will see it scales like omega squared. Right, so, um, when you go to the uh, Fermi liquid, you also find out that this uh, linter spectrum is actually bounded. Uh, when you go to zero momentum, right, the, the, the phase space squeezes out completely. So at zero momentum, it disappears. At any finite momentum, it exists next to uh, the normal hydrodynamical sector. Okay, so keep that in mind. And now we go back to the familiar case of a zero density uh, uh, CFT slash quantum critical state. Right? So it takes something like a simple five fourth. You know how it works. Um, why is this happening? 
right? So um, we are above the upper category that I mentioned usually for the self-interaction five force term is irrelevant. So the fixed point becomes a free fixed point. You look at the excitations and you actually derive free critical modes, right? They're just like basically like free modes. Now you dive under the uh, upper case dimension and you call your critical states only interacting. It's actually a statement about ignorance. I don't know whether everyone is realizing it, but actually the strongly interacting statistical physics critical state is to the best of the understanding of mankind, a state that's np hard classically. It cannot be computed as things like Monte Carlo. You can compute the exponent it's got a high accuracy, but you can never completely enumerate the state. Now, the fact of it is, because you have your scale invariance, conforming facts, you know that the only data you can uh, uh, have are these anomalous dimensions, are these exponents. So at the moment you become MP hard and scale invariant, uh, what's happening is that you uh, scale dimensions become anomalous. And that you can compute with all kinds of to, to good approximations, all the tricks of uh, statfish uh, or old fashioned high energy uh, critical theory. Okay. Now what I'm, the way I, I understand the metal is very simple. I'm saying I depart from the Fermi liquid, but now I morph my Fermi liquid scaling behavior into the scaling behavior having anomalous dimensions. And I do discover my holocaustic stage metals. Right, so uh, in a way, the most odd uh, property of the other kind of fixed metal is that you have these two sectors called drood and contracritical. And I think about uh, the uh, Fermi liquid, where you also have this drood sector that's just tied to the uh, other dynamic conservation law. Why is this thing? Uh, okay. Uh, I have no clue about it. It's the mouse. Uh, uh, uh. But now I have also that little continuum, and there I can afford to dress it up directly at zero temperature, even with anomalous dimensions, and I can get at the scaling statements, right? It's basically the scaling statements following uh, from uh, uh, the, the, the scaling geometry. Uh, you can find it in that, in the uh, nice paper by Andreas Karg and Son Hartnell, right? We just look at the scaling per C. Um, there's now one special effect. So in the Fermi gas, you cannot have this uh, linter continuous zero momentum. And according to holography, you can have it at zero momentum uh, uh, when you're dealing with this generalized Fermi liquid situation. In other words, also at Q0, that's where you see your transport, where the of your conductivity lives, et cetera, you're dealing with these two sectors. And I find it very comfortable. But the only thing you have to explain is why there are two sectors that you have these enormous exponents because your density integral, blah, blah, makes a perfect sense. The whole scaling behavior of the thing is like the scaling behavior of a Fermi liquid. Uh -uh. So, to uh, wrap this up, I would like to understand the famous critical sector of the graphic uh, size metals as Lindhart with anomalous scaling dimensions. Then it persists at zero momentum, coexisting with, I've not to, coexisting with the momentum carrier root sector slash zero sound, that's a distant Fermi liquid. It persists in the presence of a gapping order parameter, right? so you make holographic uh, uh, superconductor symptoms of the kind. And at zero temperature, again, you have this scaling geometry. Uh, it may carry different. Uh, uh, exponents than what you had in the stress metal. It may even have the same exponents. But it's a beautiful story about how this works. Right? So it's a very interesting thing. When you go to these ordered phases, somehow it has product structure because spontaneous symmetry breaking needs a uh, short product uh, type of uh, wave function. But apparently that uh, that is not grabbing everything. And there's still this uh, part of the story still uh, about the stony entangled uh, uh, stuff that is still delocalized in the big Hilbert space. Perhaps the most mysterious and intriguing uh, generic prediction of holography is 
that this colloquial sector is characterized by a robust emergent charge conjugation symmetry. Right, so uh, uh, you start out in the UV where charge conjugation is badly broken, but uh, 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 that is an irrelevant operator. You go to IR and you restore the charge conjugation symmetry. And so I would like to get a good explanation why that is in the terms of general physics language. I perceive it as mysterious. The implication is that the whole effect is vanishing. The only way to kill the whole effect is by charge communication symmetry. Right? So simple, uh, you have a current and you have uh, exactly as many positive as negative carriers. You apply a magnetic field, you get a lowest force, and the plus particles are deviated in this way, and the minus particle in that way, you accumulate as many plus as minus charges. In other words, there's no whole voltage. And keep this in mind because this will come back. Okay, now we live in a really exciting era. You can ask the question, ITC has been around for 40 years, and why is it so that we don't know whether uh, when you look at the charge response, you have this kind of holographic uh, uh, type, 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 type of excitation or whether they are more from a liquid like that would be very useful. The bottom line is that we didn't have a machine measuring this directly. It's very simple, there's just nothing. It's pretty hard to measure linear response, you know, uh, in a large parameter range of momenta and frequencies. Um, so let's say optical is great, but you only measure at Q0, and Q0 doesn't really help that much. You really need to know how it works at finite momentum. This has changed recently since about uh, three years, there's a machine online, which is an electron loss machine. It's uh, right now it's, uh, only Peter Lamonti, but everywhere in the world, people are racing to build more of these machines because they're gold mine. Peter went out, measured the charge excitation spectrum, the imaginary part of charge sensibility, uh, at optimal doping, and what he finds is in this picture, and you look at it and you find out that this is actually a Z2 infinite momentum independent uh, uh, spectrum, characterized by a marginal scanning dimension. That's a basically independent frequency and doing armic and t-scaling, etc. Right, so in principle, there's something that fits into uh, the scaling uh, laws uh, that you learn from your neo horizon geometry. Let's do a bit of a, one example of it, which I find myself very interesting. Right, so the claim is that the Fermi liquid is doing this uh, generic scaling. And now you have to ask the question, what are the exponents? That's all you need to know. Um, and the bottom line is that uh, the hyperscaling violation exponent is d minus one. The bottom line is that the number uh, of thermodynamically relevant excitation is set by the surface area of, of the uh, Fermi surface. So theta is d minus one. And then on every point of the Fermi surface, you basically have an effective CFT2, right? You're like a Lorentz invariant, one plus one dimensional theory. So you take now your scaling uh, uh, equation for the entropy, which is temperature to the power and was space dimension minus hyperscaling violation divided by the number of critical exponent. So theta is d minus one, so you have d minus d plus one divided by one. So in other words, uh, what you find is the Sommerfeld uh, 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 law. Entropy is always proportional to temperature regardless of the number of space dimensions you have. And it's all tied to the fact that the hyperscaling violation is set by the area of the Fermi surface. So now it comes. Peter Almonte measures directly that C is infinite. And as long as D minus theta is not very special, this means that, it, that the entropy becomes temperature independent, which in turn means that you have Gaussian entropy. This you find when you do your rise and from black hole. Here it is. But now we have the Cooper rates and we measure Z independently, it's infinite. So, uh, the entropy should be temperature independent. It's not. You measure it to be Sommerfeld. The entropy is just linear in temperature. Right, so in other words, when you know these facts, you can directly jump to the conclusion that this cannot possibly be a Fermi liquid, right? Because C is infinite. And in the Fermi liquid, C has to be one. Otherwise, you start to violate uh, thermodynamic systems, and thermodynamics is the most uh, honest game in town. This has been overlooked in the 30 something year history of ITC because the March Fermi liquid is saying at the same time, we have a Sommerfeld entropy 
and we have C2 infinite, how can it be? We just look at the Quasa particle that hit by this uh, we call it critical heat path. But actually, the states that are damping the fermions are not existent thermodynamically. Of course, bullshit, these things are there thermodynamically. And that means that your entropy gets fucked up. Right? This is really a silly error by John R. Farmer. So to get out of this, there's basically a very beautiful uh, uh, holographic solution. It's even top-down uh, consistent. It's called the conformal to ages two metal that you encounter in the CMD portfolio, where it says Z goes to infinite, which is good. But minus theta also goes to infinite in a way that the ratio of the two goes to one. Now you fill it in, and directly you see that you have a sum of entropy. To the best of my knowledge, it's the only thing that can happen, which is consistent because this should be a completely general scaling law. Right, so we already start to see that something of what I've said metal is going on in uh, uh, the complex. Good, are there any questions? Because now I want to change gear uh, to go for the last 25 minutes into the beef of the story. Anybody has a question? Um, maybe I could ask you a question, sorry. Yep, uh, so, so uh, I understand uh, applying a safety to a system where, which doesn't have any scales, but in the case of uh, Fermi liquid, there is a scale. So how does, how does the correspondence work? Yeah, so Blaise calls this a covariant under scale transformation. Right? You, so you look at the uh, uh, entropy, right? And uh, as I mentioned, so you see that your temperature has to be balanced by a scale for quantity, and that is this Fermi energy. Yes. Right? So uh, the, the infrared fixed point still knows about your UV cut off, right? In the conformal state, you'll forget about the scale. That's yeah, so the conformal entropy is just in a universal amplitude in front of the code like G cubed or something. Um, but you have exactly the same thing when you look at the way that scaling works in uh, a holography, right? So uh, there you say, okay, it's not a T divided by EF, but it's T divided by mu. Mu has the same meaning, right? It's the scale where you break the conformal invariance because it's associated with finite density, and then you run into this other flow, right, that start, uh, continues to remember that it started at the chemical potential. It's re precisely this thing that on the one hand, you have scale, and on the other hand, you see algebraic behavior, right, it's, that it's so special for the Fermi liquid scaling, but that scaling is precisely of the same kind as you have in this finite density system. It's really an essential point. I didn't understand for quite a long while, but I think it's very beautiful. Thank you. Get it, right? More questions? So it's actually, I have, a, I have a one question. Okay. Um, what if Z is not one or infinity? Like, let's say it's uh, some fraction, like yeah. three quarters. Wouldn't that, would it still be a Fermi large, surface? Uh, you are no Fermi surface. Uh, for, when Z is not one, you will not have a Fermi surface. Mm -hmm. The way around is when you have a Fermi surface that is the macroscopic object that acts like an order parameter that really defines your Fermi liquid. Mm -hmm. yeah, so there's just, just uh, kind of a folklore, uh, I can do a long stories about it, that say in the coupe you have Fermi surface. There are really no Fermi surfaces uh, when you're not in an overdog machine. It, it's myth mythology. Okay. What you can have is, you know, uh, you have basically microscopic dynamics, right? So you uh, consider a detail model or something, and you have these holes hopping around in the spin system. When you do uh, like four hops and two spin flips, you already start to uh, um, uh, uh, develop structure in momentum space. It's typically like that these states that are at low energy sort of pile up, say, at the no directions whatsoever, or what will be a Fermi liquid, but a uh, Fermi surface. But a Fermi surface is really a different thing. It has to be this, this, this thing that's precisely localized in single particle momentum space. Mm -hmm. Never true, you know, when you look at the underdog coupes. Okay. People are just imprecise. There are no Fermi surfaces in underdog coupes. Okay. Thank you. And this whole thing, I think, yeah, uh, fermionic states of matter, it, it, it somehow remembers the, the uh, fermionic statistics, right? With the role of mu, et cetera. That's a lot like the Fermi pressure thing. But there's nothing like a Fermi uh, surface out there, right? Theta is actually minus infinite and not at all d minus one. Jan, hi. Uh, please play it. Hi, Blaise. Uh, I just had a, a comment on the charge conjugation symmetry thing. Ah, uh, you're think, my guru. No, it's just 
so you know we we usually we think of this for neutral states and it's very clear why this is charge conjugation symmetric but as you were pointing out we're interested in understanding how this works once you turn on finite density yeah absolutely but the the subtlety which is connecting to this discussion that you presented is that this finite charge density you turn it on in the uv right yeah, yeah. And then you have to figure out how this flows in the uh, to the IR. Yeah. And at least the way I understand it, uh, there are two ways that we can think about some type of charge conjugation symmetry in the IR. Either your charge operator really is irrelevant along yeah, the. I, I, so, I said that is my understanding. Yeah. The other one, yeah. So then you recover some kind of neutral geometry in the IR, and then you'll have probably some kind of charge conjugation symmetry, but not quite, because this will be connected to some irrelevant operator. Right, so it switches on when you go off shell. Uh, so its effects would, might still be important for a number of properties. But then there's another way to think about this, where the, your charge operator remains important all the way down to in the IR, for instance, like in Rice and Nordstrom. Yeah. And then the trick is that, you know, another, where charge conjugation symmetry buys you quite a bit is that it, there's a, um, a net zero momentum. Yeah. So even at finite density, uh, you can define this type of current that will not carry any momentum. And that's a, a yeah. different way of thinking about yeah. charge conjugation symmetry. Yeah. Now I'm not sure which one you want yeah. as far as you know, non Fermi liquids are concerned. Yeah. But these are two ways that you can think about this. I mean, which I would like to get back to this. This is a real crucial point. Now, uh, Chris, I can uh, show to you is, um, go back to the Fermi liquid, right? You have the Lindhardt continuum. Uh, isn't there also this sort of sense of charge communication symmetry? And how would you classify that, right, in terms of your two possibilities? And I don't quite know the answer to it. My... I, I don't have a very... My, my, my uh, point of recognition is that Fermi liquid. And the question I'm asking is like, can I recognize that emergent charge going symmetry that I find actually very mysterious in terms of, of the Fermi liquid fixed point? And my, my understanding is that it won't quite work. I think, so these, these... So what we have in holography, as you well know, yeah. is this uh, spectrum of IR quasi-normal modes yeah. that coalesce into a branch cut at zero temperature. Yeah. But the way they coalesce to this branch cut is because they, they're located on the imaginary axis at Absolutely. multiples of temperature. Yeah. Yeah. And so as you take T to zero, they come together, but they come together at a very specific rate, which is linear in T. Yeah. But then we'll, we can also have these other modes yeah, that can go faster or slower. And I think this is where maybe you have some analog of the Linhard versus quasi-particle continuum. Because there are, there are definitely two types of modes. I, Blaise, I know what I'm doing here, right? So uh, I know um, um, right, that I have for normal critical states, I mean, your branch et etc., are just doing the job as your identity of normal critical states. There's nothing special about it, right? And then you have to ask the question: What happens when you go from the non-interacting critical theory above the upper critical field dimension to the interacting one? And, and, the, and the change is really in: you go from this three mode spectrum to this branch cut thing. Right? So the branch cut is for me the sort of sign: okay, you're dealing with this density internal stuff, and I love it for that reason. When you go to the Fermi liquid, right, you get again the uh, integer exponents where Ari uh, was arguing about it, right? That yes, you get this almost as squared spectrum, et cetera, which is morally equivalent to make the statement that you're free modes. That's what you think about, right? That's all related. So step out of the holographic corner and, and try to make more precise this lifting of the mean fieldish Fermi liquid structure to the uh, anomalous dimensions, blah, blah, critical structure. Please, we should continue this discussion. You're my favorite partner. Yeah, yeah. I have to tell a bit more, you know, I really get out of... Uh... I don't mean to derail you. Yeah. No, no, we are the best friends in this. We try to learn this from you. Uh... Okay, so I'm getting uh, only 15 minutes. Um, 
and I don't want to keep you any longer than necessary. So perhaps I try to go very quick uh, with the first issue of the uh, uh, discovery of a, uh, um, it is really the, the, the proof that you have uh, quantum critical phases, quantum critical points don't exist in Cooper's methodology. And then I would really like to emphasize a bit the second part, uh, which is pin stripe that alludes precisely to the discussion that we just started with place. And then I make a kind of go quick with this last part, just warning you that there's this new uh, empirical agenda out there to uh, uh, think hard about uh, 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 using holography. Okay, I don't have to tell you this. Um, now, so the bottom line is that when you have densely entangled matter, um, it's impossible to identify uh, class of particles. And there's a very simple story class of particle needs that you're somehow local in a single particle representation. Uh, when you are densely entangled, you are delocalized in a very big many body Hilbert space. And there's no way that you can sort of localize your single particle constant numbers when you can do that. There are just no particles, right? So, uh, looking at absence of class of particle peaks and spectroscopy peaks that can measure it um, is a great thing to just make sure for yourself that you're dealing with this uh, uh, supreme matter. And surely the corporates have played a big role in that in the history of mankind. Uh, uh, this is a nice illustration. So you uh, go uh, 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 as function of uh, doping. So here you go from about optimal doped to overdoped. You look at how the internodal spectra, as it's called, uh, for transmission spectra, uh, evolve as function of uh, uh, energy. Right, and you find out that when you're optimally doped, it is completely uh, flat in coherent continua. And then you go to overdoped, and you see these uh, nice little cross particle peaks sitting there. You go down in a superconducting state, right? And uh, there you form cross particles, right? And then you see here that there's just a shift from the cross particle normal state to the one in the superconduct state like PCS, and here you start out with something completely incoherent, and in the superconducting state you develop this class particle peak. I will always striking that in holography uh, uh, you have uh, the same behavior. That's Faulkner at all uh, all story that you find out that uh, you can be extremely sharp, well defined volume of excitations in an uh, uh, holographic superconductor. Um, now. The kind of standard view uh, for a long time in the Cooper's has been you find a strangeness associated with stress metal, etc., and it's rooted in a conventional quantum uh, phase transition that happens at optimal doping. So there's some order that comes to an end at optimal doping, and you have the, these kit the critical order plans of fluctuations. These couple to the uh, uh, sort of Fermi gas electrons called Hertz Millis. And that's then supposed to explain all the optimists you see, right? And when you know a bit about condensed matter physics, you have uh, picked up that all the condensed matter people are basically all the time chasing a quantum critical point everywhere, including the, in the cuprates, right? So, uh, the, so the standard view people believe that there is a so called quantum critical wedge that's very characteristic for a conventional quantum phase transition. And all you have to do is figure out the quantum critical point, and then you find out that these quantum critical fluctuations are among others good in mediating a pairing force between these Fermi gas electrons and it then to explain everything. Okay, so this is seen as fact. But the question is, is there evidence? And the answer is actually, uh, uh, the whole community has been chasing that order parameter coming to an end at optimal doping. And of the 20 years of, or 25 years of hard work, nobody has ever found an order parameter coming to an end uh, more or less at optimal doping. This is basically new. So this is uh, very recent. It's got published uh, late uh, 2019. I was myself involved with, you know, the guy was pitching our story. And really very, very striking. So this is work by the uh, uh, photo mission group uh, at Stanford, uh, Zig Shen, the king of photo mission. It was really done by this brilliant Jim Gatz student, Sudi Chen. What you're looking at here is the sort of standard way to represent photo emission data. You can take either the upper or lower panels. Uh, uh, this is just a bit image enhanced, so it's a bit better. Uh, so let's look at this one and think it's like uh, uh, what you measure. So uh, when you go along the vertical axis, uh, you go down in energy, uh, the horizontal axis momentum, and you basically look at the momentum at its own boundary 
uh, around the internal point. And then the color coding tells you how much spectral weight there is. Right, so you're sitting at these antennas, and what you see is these vague blobs. And now what you do is you just change doping in very small intervals of about less than a tenth of a percent. Here you are in the undertope state, and what you see is all the time these very broad featureless uh, 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 blobs that I already showed. And then, you surprise this, you go to a critical doping of 0.19. This is due to, to everybody believes that there should be here a conophase transition. And what you see is a sudden dramatic change where you go from this completely incoherent spectral weight to a spectrum that's actually a pretty good class of particle spectrum. You suddenly see here these uh, peaks sitting and they disperse as they should according to the band structure. In other words, instead of having here a smooth continuous transition, right, these are rather large, large energies for the 0.2 electron volt, when you're dealing with continuous phase transitions, you have here this very smooth crossover uh, uh, behavior associated with quantum critical wedge. Instead, you get a sudden jump. Uh, I like this best, best, it's sort of quantifying it. So, um, this is the energy distribution curve, so you fix momentum, and then you uh, uh, vary your energy, and it's just a line fit. And what you have is, in the, uh, when you're just below this critical doping, you see this featureless blob, that you already saw uh, when I showed this temperature-dependent data. And then you go to PC is 0.19 plus a tiny little bit, and it completely reconstructs into, in a thing, having two nice peaks peak here and a peak there. Now, as it turns out, when you just take uh, the kind of marginal uh, self-energies you measure along the node, for those who are really into this game, and you plug this into the dispersions of the internodal uh, direction, precisely you get a spectrum, that is the uh, gray line that is the fit. That is precisely as if you have the same type of quality of cluster particles as you seem to have along the nodes. Uh, when you are uh, in a slightly overdoped regime. And then you change your doper by less than a percent, and this spectrum completely changed in this very uh, incoherent spectrum. In order to mimic this with a self-energy expression, you need the self-energy is about 10 times bigger uh, than you find at the node. So you have this enormous uh, change going on in the way uh, uh, that the uh, uh, photomission electrons see that world. Bottom line is this cannot be possibly be explained as a quantum critical point type of thing. That should be very smooth. It's much more like a first order transition. We have two phases, right? And the first order transition things change drastically on a microscopic scale as they do on a macroscopic scale. You go from water to steam, right? You go from low density to high density. It's just one very odd thing. So you see this big change on the microscopic scale, uh, uh, energy is four of tensile electron volt. And normally, it is this microscopic sudden change is amplified in the first order transition uh, in a microscopic realm. It jumps even harder. And the reality is that you see it, uh, the sudden change on the microscopic scale. You go to the microscopic scale, and everything is very, very smooth. Nobody saw ever the telltale signs that are so easy on a first order transition. DC is completely smooth, there's nothing going on, it's a volume of your crystal, blah, 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 blah. That's very peculiar. It's actually a principle of classical matter. Uh, when you do your RG, and you do it with the first order transition, you find a runaway flow, right? By sort of saying uh, the, the solar change gets more and more uh, amplified, I can figure out from your RG uh, that you have first order transition. That law is violated here. Right, so my good feeling is it's somewhat related to this constant supremacy. At least one of these phases is then this, this uh, uh, densely entangled phase, and apparently other principles are at work. I can think hard about it. Um, the good news is that you surely need two different phases of matter in order to see the jumpy behavior. So we're dealing with quantum critical phases, at least on the underdog side, because it drives out that is dealing with holography, blah, blah. That's a solid evidence now for quantum critical phase behavior, which is much more in tune with holography, right? It's a generalized Fermi liquid. It's a phase of matter. You don't need a quantum critical point. 
talking for some people in uh, from those biophysics. Okay, now I would like to zoom in. Uh, oh, I'm running out of time. Let's see how far I get in the uh, spin stripe uh, story. Oops, I really not much time to tell you anything about the history of stripes. I mean, it started out by me. It, it uh, was really very good for my early career. I was putting out this conventional mean field theory in a Herbert model, uh, figuring out that uh, when you take a doped mod insulator, it really likes to do these so-called stripes, right? You see something stripey, I will explain now what it means. Um, and actually, the story was rooted in something that was quite fashionable in the uh, 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 1980s. The sushi vehicle solitons that are known in our energy physics as RT for heavy zero modes. How does it work? You take uh, as a, a plastic like polyacetylene, right? So it's a, a double bond, single bond, double bond, etc. These things were back then fashionable uh, because you could make them metallic. Um, Right, and then you uh, imagine you make you a domain model, a kink in a dynamization pattern. You solve your zero particle equation, you find out that you form a precise zero mode. It's topological, it's made out of half a conduction band state and half a phantom band state. When you plug in one electron in a zero mode, you get a particle that only carries a spin, it's called a spin on. When you uh, plug in zero or two electrons in a zero mode, you get a particle that only carries charge and no spinners, so hold on. That was the origin of the spinners and the holons. Now you can go now to your Herbert type problem, you do your mean field, you figure out that actually it works pretty much the same way as Zucci vehicle with the dynamization. Um, and the bottom line is that the, uh, you want to form an antifire magnet that takes a lot of uh, uh, your dynamization pattern. And your preferred solution in one dimension, I mean, field is like uh, uh, you have your anti Mac, you add one hole to it, and you have like spin up, spin down, spin up, spin down. You go through this point where the charge localizes, you find out that the anti magnet order parameter has flipped. Right? So uh, you now have the magnetic domain walls uh, instead of the uh, ramification kinks. And you solve your problem, you find out again, you have this zero mode out there, it's pretty much the same thing as uh, uh, Sushi V. Heger, right? And this is just the hold on. And it's actually quite like the hold on you find in uh, Pete Hansen's solutions. You want to mention this no matter what you do, it always looks the same. Now, my discussion was very simple go to two dimensions and hold ons don't work. But when you make a string of hold ons, it works fine. Right? So you go in this direction, you make hold on here, hold on here, hold on here, et cetera. And um, uh, they find out that your mid gap state, your zero mode, turns into a mid gap band. And now the good idea is to keep this mid gap band empty because then you have a nice little band gap that's stabilizing the uh, this mean field stripes uh, stripe phase. Now it turns out that this is actually a great theory. It really works uh, all the time. It's things like you dope nickel H, you dope cobalt H, you dope manganite. These things are all insulators when they're doped. And uh, in all cases, people have looked for it. They found these stripes. So stripes are very generic in uh, the modern insulators. And the only exceptions are the cuprates. The cuprates stay metallic. However, there are, there's sort of a close approach to these uh, vetchy mean field stripes, also in the cuprates and in the 204 system. Right when the mid 90s was found, that you basically form these stripes, as I just explained. Except that the domain walls are half filled, so you have uh, one hole per two domain wall unit cells. And you see that because when you change the doping, the distance between the domain walls is varying according to this rule. And now you uh, realize that this sort of gap thing is it's very generic, basically saying uh, it's commensuration physics. And uh, what you form is higher order commensurate states, and these things should always be insulating. But then these Cooper sites were discovered, and the stiff cells, of course, measured. Uh, all of us expect the same thing as the nucleus, blah, blah, and good exponential uh, behavior of the resistivity, activated behavior. But instead, what was measured is something that was very mysterious and still is, which is a very slow logarithmic power law type of divergence when you uh, get below the charge ordering or the, the side ordering temperature, uh, which is basically saying it's not an insulator. 
the, uh, the, this role is you need a nice fat energy gap to stabilize your uh, 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 charge commensurate behavior, it's not there. How can, for God's sake, uh, this happen? This very soft behavior should mean that it's impossible to keep these stripes at the density of uh, uh, one hole per two dimensional unit cells. It's always very crystalline. Reason that I call these things stripey phases or stripish phases. Okay, now we go fast forward, and many of you will have seen, have seen this masterpiece uh, by uh, Sasha and uh, Thomas. Right, so what they did is uh, they wanted also to see whether this kind of physics can be made out of black holes. They started out with the system having an explicit periodic potential in the background, and then they hit it with the spontaneous crystal. It is this uh, uh, two plus one dimensional or three plus one dimensional action construction. Uh, Started by uh, um, uh, 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 Aristos and uh, 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 I forget the name, E, good friend of mine, doesn't matter. And the bottom line is um, that you find pretty much the same behavior. So it's all about commensuration physics. A MOS insulator should be viewed generically as a commensurate crystal. So you have a background potential, you have a system that wants to crystallize. When the lattice constants of both systems are the same, you pin uh, the uh, spontaneous crystal, right? And, and this pinning gap is equal to the mod gap. So that's what they found. And now you can play games. Uh, you can actually go to incommensurate situations. And uh, uh, um, my friends found out that you really sort of form literal striped faces out there where the role of the antiviral magnetism is taken by staggered orbital currents that occur naturally. Uh, it's all very nice. The real take home message at this point in time is um, so you now uh, look at the resistivity associated with these holographic mod insulators slash commensurate side phases. And you vary temperature, you hit the ordering temperature of your spontaneous crystal where the mod insulator sets in, and yes, something is happening out there. But it's not that the exponential behavior uh, sets in as you expect for a pinned uh, density wave. Yeah, there's a droop peak uh, in the metal. You go into the density wave and you see that thing shifting up because that's the thing that gets pinned. Instead, you find this algebraically diverging uh, resistivity. And it's, of course, very simple. What you do is uh, you isolate a quantum critical sector. Right? So your droop part is pushed up by the pinning. What's left behind is that quantum critical sector. In other words, you isolate this quantum critical sector that's supposed to survive uh, uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking. We had collectively all the same thought. Isn't that a, a, a great way of explaining the slow divergences you see in experiment? And also the other one, even Steve Kilson, etc., that precisely the same reflex. So it's a big puzzle all along for cyber people, but it came from this is a real explanation. Right, so once again, um, oops. Uh, we are basically talking about this uh, quantum critical uh, uh, continuum of holography, and I like to read this generalized uh, Lindhardt. Uh, so the, uh, this actually the platform, this matter would be a zero sound. Um, and then you do this uh, autocratic mod insulator thing, and you gap this zero sound mode, and all that's left is a critical continuum out there. Yet again, um, so it persists in the presence of a gapping order parameter, that's what we need. And uh, next to doing algebraic behaviors and everything, it has this robust emergent charge conjugation symmetry that uh, Blaise also alluded to in our discussion. That has a ramification that the whole effect should vanish. Uh, so we did a preliminary computation done by a new grad student. Uh, uh, there's actually a little uh, nasty uh, uh, conceptual bug in this whole affair that I won't give away. What you have to do is you have to make a real two-dimensional crystal. So this is like a two-dimensional checkerboard. When you look at the magnetic transport, here you see the DC resistivity again doing this a slow outbreak like upturn. The feeling is that this is all cost out if you really don't understand it that well yet. You look at the sigma xy, the whole uh, uh, conductivity, and you see that's building up. 
in the normal uh, uh, state. And there it goes with the face of Cetian and Zoof, it goes on all the way and it basically vanishes within the numerical resolution where you're well inside this uh, holographic multi state. Right? So we confirm that you isolate the, uh, the uh, quantum critical sector and that that is also in this case uh, characterized by emergent charge conjugation, meaning a vanishing hole. And now I come to the data, the big surprise. This is data taken by a lady uh, that's employed by the uh, Florida National High Magnetic Field Lab, uh, Dragana Popovich. And at some point, Dragana just came to me, as you know, uh, you're Mrs. Stripes, and we took this new data. What do you think about it? I got extremely excited about it. What's going on here? This is about the stripey uh, um, two on four systems, where you pl plug in some europium or neodymium to make the stripes a bit stronger. And the trouble is that in uh, zero field, there's always this remnant superconductivity, not entirely clear where it comes from. In order to figure out uh, what the real uh, uh, properties are of a real uh, side phase, you have to suppress it. And that you do by applying a magnetic field, and you have to apply a pretty large magnetic field of order 20 Tesla. Out here, it's all superconducting stuff. It is about uh, vortex fluids, blah, blah. It's expected here, and uh, they know very well how to diagnose it. A uh, big field in the mid nights, uh, the gun was part of that. Here you have used strange metal. And in this light blue area, you uh, isolate apparently the physics of a real pure sp uh, spin stripe face. So you find indeed the, the, this uh, uh, outbreak like the first of resistivity and a real big deal is. Dagana finds a precise vanishing of the whole coefficient in his whole face. Now, why is that? Okay, let me show some real data. This is just a stiffness function of temperature at the full field, but then you see the slow upturn. Now, there's some uh, field dependence out here. No time to go into it, it's not very spectacular. Then you look at the whole coefficient, and you have to look at these data at uh, lower temperatures and very large fields, right? So the field axis, and you see out here, you see it best, right? That this whole coefficient out here becomes really zero. This is a skip. So why is this extremely interesting data? So the only way to have a finishing whole coefficient is by establishing precise charge communication symmetry. There's no other way, it's one to one. Right, so finishing hole is equal to emerging charge conjugation symmetry. When you do your normal particle physics, your normal uh, thermoliquids, blah, blah, in order to hit this precise uh, 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 emergence of charge conjugation, you need infinite fine tuning. Right, you can think about uh, electron and hole pockets. They have to be precisely equally large. The velocity should be precisely the same in order. The precise compensation in reality, when you vary the field a bit of temperature a bit, you know, your pockets will breathe a bit, uh, you will hit different velocities, blah, blah. So it's impossible uh, with conventional physics to make this big parameter regime where the whole effect is vanishing all the time. You do your holography and you actually learn that there is some mechanism out there that we don't quite understand, listen to early discussion with Blaise, that is saying emergent charge communication is generic. Uh, at the fixed point of this uh, 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 strange metal. So I think this is very exciting. The real good news is um, that uh, we can now use the what we know about the, the uh, scaling machinery to come up with predictions for other properties, like uh, all kinds of uh, thermal transport properties, blah, blah. Predictions for, say, the optical conductivity. I think we already know how, it, how it's supposed to work. And we can bring this to the experimentalists that can try to measure this in big fields, which is a good employment program for them. And when these uh, uh, predictions work out, it's basically about you know, scaling behavior of this stuff. Um, I think we prove it. There's an enormous redundancy in the number of predictions you can make. The trouble is a bit that I think nobody really understands how this uh, neo Ryson geometry precisely works when you have this inhomogeneous deep infrareds. Right? So we have only access to it numerically. So I find it's a very high priority uh, issue to figure that out insofar as it can be figured out how the scaling laws look like when you have these uh, relevant holographic lattices.
Good. Oops, I'm already out of time. Uh, uh, I'm, uh, I'm, let me go to the very last subject. It, it's just an announcement because I'm really out of time. Um, right, so it's about the overtop coupe. So we just learned uh, that there's this first order to, uh, phase transition optimal doping. So the overtop state is some kind of similar dynamic identity. Bottom line is uh, you saw this cross apart emerge um, and already uh, uh, quite a while ago, and I can see it all found actually that in the cleanest uh, 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 overdub cuprates, you see beautiful constellations uh, uh, telling you that there is this big firm of service as you expected. Right? So it seems to be really tough evidence for the presence of a Fermi liquid. That's the way it's a Fermi service, you have to Fermi liquid. All along there was this sort of uh, uh, thing that didn't quite fit it. You look at the transport, you don't really see a T squared with stiffity anywhere. So it's basically, you can fit it either with this so-called Matisse or Antimatisse form, combination of linear T and synthetic T, where linear T is sort of disappearing when you were increase the doping, that was kind of an easy. And people really uh, started to get nervous about the overdose state uh, when the data of uh, uh, Ivan Bosevich uh, hit, hit at the market. Right? Before it was basically like, okay, it turns from liquid, it's doing BSS, things, who cares about it? And uh, Eva demonstrated that when you go overdope, you expect a firmer liquid. And we have a firmer liquid. There's a law out there saying that the superfluid density should be equal to the normal density. So all electrons in the Fermi C should participate. And the theme behind it, like a theorem, uh, what you actually need is a uh, Galen invariance. But uh, when you have a very clean system like the Octave Cooper, it can be very clean. You're so close to uh, the lane invariance that you think it has to be nearly or by. What happens is uh, indicated in this figure. Uh, this is what you expect a green line for the superfluid density. This is what you measure. Right? So uh, it's way smaller and actually diminishes when you go to uh, very high dope, but you see it's uh, disappearing. In fact, what you find is. Uh, that uh, TC is proportional to, to superfluid density and spatial is characteristic for bosons in two dimensions. Right, so something is badly violated. You cannot say I have a good Fermi liquid that on the one hand and at the same time have this behavior for the superfluid density. This is what I really want to, to show. This is brand new stuff. So the, the, the paper went out of science a week ago due to Nigel Hussey in uh, Nijmegen and Bristol. Um, and let me just tell you the uh, discovery, and then I uh, uh, stop talking. That was the discovery. You just measure the uh, resistivity in very big fields. You can also do these 35 Tesla fields. And now you have your eyes focused on the magneto resistance. And now you say, I can write the uh, resistivity in the field as a uh, uh, part that's really field independence and a part that is field dependence that I factorize in a temperature dependent part and a part that is uh, dependent on a scanning quantity, which is uh, the cyclotron frequency times the Planckian time, right? So magnetic field is about a frequency and you have to combine it with uh, some kind of relaxation time in order to have a dimensionless parameter. And now you have to take the Planckian time uh, to arrive at your scanning parameter. This has everything to do with Planckian dissipation. So you make this answer, so it just means everything. And then you uh, uh, realize that when you take the, the derivative uh, uh, of the uh, resistivity to fields, and you manipulate these other factors, that you should get a beautiful scaling function when this thing makes sense. And that's what demonstrated here. Right, so T divided by HP of T, which is this vector here, the, the rho the, the H is a scaling function as a function of X that's here on the, on the X axis. Uh, right, so the derivative uh, of the scaling function to X, which is the derivative to field. Now you look at it, you find out that you have to take for this uh, temperature dependent factor uh, just linear resistivity. And for this x-dependent part, you just take a simple quadrature. 
and you have a perfect fit at this test line and it fits all these different systems. So there's a variety of overdoped bismuth and thallium superconductors at various uh, 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 doping and they do all the same thing. For this factor B that is telling us about the balance between field and uh, temperature, there's basically uh, doping independence indicated here and this alpha factor here, uh, here, it's just decreasing, much in the same way as fluid fluid density is decreasing. It's basically telling how much of this linear and T stuff that's doing Planckian sinks is around there. But it's demonstrating that next to this uh, thermal liquid sector, in some kind of coexistence, we don't really understand how and why, there's just still this strange metal type thing, which is doing this, what we call Planckian quadrature. So the Planckian quadrature, I think I say it here, uh, you don't see in underdog cuprates. A version of it uh, is claimed by the uh, Florida group to be there in fields of the Teslas at optimal doping in 2 and 4. Uh, so you see uh, signs of it. But it was seen very, very clearly in a conventional conductor point system in an iron superconductor. You really see what you expect for the conventional conductor point scenario. The uh, uh, constant some splash. Generally, we don't understand it. It's again an holographic uh, uh, exercise, holographic exercise, because you basically say there's this perfect balance between the uh, field of electron frequency and the Planckian time. And the Planckian time is associated with the time circle, uh, while the fields are associated with the lowest force. I'm the real active saying, how can it be that these are so beautifully in this quality of relation? I'm aware of one real theory giving this, and I think that both uh, Lee and Enos are in the audience. They came up with a story of a DPI action plus a dilaton doing this quadrature uh, behavior. And I would still like to learn from them whether there's some sort of general principle behind it uh, giving this quadrature behavior. So, uh, oops, uh, not quite the end of the story, because by looking at the uh, 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 Magneto resist resistance, we isolate a strange component out there, which seems to be related to this uh, low superfluid density thing, as if this strange component is doing the superconductivity, leaving the uh, thermal liquid part uh, unaffected. So there is the thermal liquid part to the degree, um, it should be here, right? Yeah. You uh, look at the whole response. And you take the fact the insistence, we know exactly how the uh, firm service looks like because of the control oscillations. You do your very reasonable uh, fermiology exercise, you find out that actually the whole response of the system can be understood very well in terms of this conventional uh, uh, fermiology, the whole response associated with your thermal liquid. Um, you look at the magneto resistance, and normally. The whole response and the uh, uh, magnetic resistor hang together, so you always have this dimensions parameter, where this in the firm liquid just a normal cost particle scattering time, right? And the whole response goes like linear in X, and the magnetic resistor goes quadratically in X, should be the same X. You go to the uh, magnetic resistor that's expressing here, and you find out it's completely uh, uh, dominated by this Planckian quadrature. Uh, uh, behavior. So that should mean that the same Planckian quadrature behavior should dominate the whole, but you look at the whole and you don't see anything of it. As if it's vanishing, when you ask the whole question, now when you think again about the uh, judge conjugation symmetry thing, you find out that judge conjugation symmetry imposes that the whole coefficient vanishes while the magneto resistance is simply there. It's very easy to understand that. Right, so it seems that again, this uh, quantum critical sector thing is somehow showing through, but now it somehow coexists with this firm liquid thing, this firm surface. It's very strange business because your uh, firm surface seems so by precisely the your volume here. Right, so you look at the uh, volume of the uh, firm surface that, that occupies in uh, a moment space, it tells you about the total number. Uh, particle density uh, via the volume theorem seems to be uh, much precise, but now you have this other component that should suck up density, say the superfluid density. 
And if it does so, it would violate the linear volume. So the term surface or the term liquid is in one or the other way crazy. Uh, last one, uh, but, but not least, you can just look at, um, uh, as you have did, did this component out here, this may be more the firm liquid component, you can look at this, and you actually find that this, uh, 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 this component doesn't know anything about the elastic scattering. Right, so where is it? Um, so actually, when you take that component, it should turn into a perfect liquid in the zero temperature and magnetic field limit. Now this we know kind of, when you have the best uh, 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 two on four superconducts and you go to optimal doping and you extrapolate uh, the linear stiffity uh, below TC with a, with a straight line, you find out that there's no intercept. This is sort of a famous thing out there that there's this the suggestion that your normal state, when you could force it all the way to zero temperature, would actually turn into a perfect uh, uh, fluid. And I have sort of reasons to uh, think that this is very interesting. And this is what you also seem to see in optically doping. Really getting out of time. Um, so, is there a killer app? This one I have to show. There's an established success. Put the black hole eyeglasses on, and it's happening here. Right? So, uh, this is out eyeglasses, this is with, with eyeglasses, which uh, makes you think about a very popular movie. And you become razor sharp discerning big deal anomalies in experimental data. It keeps kept me uh, from the street, right? I couldn't even tell all the stories I was involved with. So I'm all the time uh, called up by experimental fantasies. You know, can you have a look? I think there's something strange. I have a look with my black hole glasses on, and I isolate the, uh, the, 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 the uh, empirical anomalies in the data. And then we managed to get it into uh, people glossy leak, right? the science of nature. And right now I'm scoring about an average one nature of science per year, a second to less also typically. When I would be employed in rural China, I would be a real estate ty tycoon because in rural China, every time you score nature of science, you get an apartment building. Right? So this really works for me. I love these uh, 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 holographic uh, ideas because it's so useful in the daily life of an analyzing and get, getting the profundity out of uh, data. Now there's now a lot of things to say, and perhaps I uh, just stop. Um, yeah, so there's the uh, homework exercises. Uh, again, for those that are really into the business, what are my primary wishes? I would like to know how scanning geometries work in the systems where you have a manifest in homogeneous geometry, um, right? And we uh, uh, have to still figure out whether it works uh, uh, whether it literally applies to things that I've seen in experiments. Um, where are we? Yeah, for the last piece, I have the desire to hear good stories about this blanking quadrature business. And there may be real an issue with the understanding of thermal liquids and holography, right? So it's about electrical stars, but we never really got it done. Could it be that there are big surprises out there? Uh, 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 some are telling us uh, that you can have these situations where somehow uh, a thing that really looks like a firm liquid coexists there with a strange metal type thing in the way I uh, try to describe based on data. Guys, it's really time to stop. Uh, thank you for your patience. I apologize for taking so much time. Thank you very much, Jeff. Yeah, very, very nice talk. <laughs> so even if it's over time, let's see if, if there are questions. So. Because one advantage of these online talks is that whoever wants to leave doesn't have to open the door. Exactly. <laughs> How many people are left? Well, not many. I, so. I have a question. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, okay. I'd like to ask about the uh, the vanishing of the Hall ratio that you talked about in these uh, this this recent it's yeah. experimental paper. Yeah. So it's also been observed in a simpler setting in these amorphous uh, thin film superconductors by Capotone. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, 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 right. yeah, yeah. And so there, I would have expected it to have a maybe a simpler explanation in terms of vortex physics. Yeah. But yeah. but are you suggesting that maybe there's a that we should this holographic explanation of particle hole symmetry should also apply there? Yeah, that's basically about the. Uh, 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 this whole context, right? Did you go from the uh, uh, subconductor to either the, the Bose metal or the Bose, uh, the, the Bose uh, um, insulator? It makes me nervous, is the answer. Um, 
to my personal opinion, uh, the, 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 the vanishing of local efficient in that context is not understood. I don't know how far you are, but um, uh, perhaps the best uh, theoretical work on it is by uh, uh, Philip Phillips. And the bottom line of Philip is when you start out in the UV uh, with a broken charge communication, right? You have your Joseon junction network at a final kind of potential, as it's called in the uh, uh, business. You will uh, have no charge communication symmetry in the deep IR when you do anything you uh, dare to do, you know, in terms of glassy physics, blah, blah. And only when you start out with a perfect charge communication symmetry in the UV, right, you will find it. And I may perhaps argue that these uh, assistance various CD, these superconductive to post metal also effort transitions mm -hmm. are always kind of tailored to be uh, at effective zero, zero current potential in, in the context of the uh, phase dynamics. Mm -hmm. You ask a very good question. It's the only loophole, right? Um, and I haven't really found a way to avoid completely that loophole, yeah. Mm -hmm. But so there's a way forward basically saying when it is holography, then we can compute a lot of other properties, right? Uh, also right. thermal transport, et cetera. And that should form such a uh, uh, return set that we can really exclude anything else than this explanation. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Don't know whether you have any other answer, right? But it's really, uh, you know, a thing to think hard about. Uh, can I ask a question? Up. Uh, Jan, thank you very much for this very nice talk. Hi, this Elias, right? Hi, Elias. I've heard you in a while. You saw your um, my show. Uh, I have a question, maybe uh, following up on Luca's question. Yep. So, is it true that the whole resistance vanishes in all this region you showed there? or it's becoming smaller and smaller as the magnetic field is becoming larger? No, no. Um, let, let me just show you the data. Where, where the, are we? Um, too far? Yeah. This is really the raw data. I right? did these uh, right uh, panels just for the two different compounds. And uh, I just fix your eyes on uh, arrow bars. And all these different uh, 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 experimental traits right, at different temperatures, it's all, you know, deep in this blue area. Right, but what, what I'm and trying to understand And then it's like you have a, a finite error bars, um, uh, but within the finiteness of these error bars, it becomes zero. So a dragonic is actually a bit of flak. Um, that the error bars are such that you shouldn't really jump to the conclusion that it's precisely zero. Right, so the next thing to do is um, uh, to, 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 to further squeeze the error bars. See, it's not so easy, you know, you really run into the sensitivity of your electronics and it's all happening at low temperatures and it's very large fields, right? It's, it's all, you know, you see it, right? It's like 20, uh, 30 Tesla. Uh, uh, so, what, what I'm, uh, Jan, what I'm trying to understand, is this compatible with the uh, whole resistance falling off like the power of the magnetic field? Uh, no, it really uh, becomes rigorously zero. Right, so the um, way to look at it is, so here you vary your uh, magnetic field. Claim is here, so in this uh, vortex fluid regime, your whole response is quite finite. And then within the error bars, it turns uh, uh, suddenly zero here and it continues to be zero all over the place um, as uh, when you vary the field. I see. That is the claim, right? That it's really a phase of matter characterized by zero uh, whole effect. I see. Uh, I have also uh, another question. You mentioned when you were discussing the ARPES data from Stanford that a certain discontinuity in uh, the response was making you think that instead of a continuous transition, you had a first order transition. Is this what this I just is supposed to hit your right? eyeballs, uh, Elias? I've rarely seen data where the sudden change is so obvious. Right? So here you vary. You don't no, 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 I understand this. I understand this. Right, and then you but see the face, uh, some contrast. I say this is the best way to look at it. You know, this is the line plus they're always most honest. So you look here, you take your EDC, and you find out that uh, uh, within a doping change of less than a percent, 
you go from this very uh, uh, incoherent spectrum to uh, the spectrum where you're pretty good cross particle peaks when you think about it. Right, but it, what, it, what I wanted to point out here is that the fact that a response function is discontinuous does not necessarily imply that there is a discontinuous phase transition in the theory because we have examples in holographic theories at least you know where uh, there is a continuous phase transition and where response functions are discontinuous. Um, I don't quite understand the statement. I can imagine that you can find loopholes in holography. It's surely unrelated to anything that looks like Hertz Millers. Right, so um, this is just a cartoon, right? Did you say um, you sit here at large energy, right? So it is, okay, the response function is this very primitive object called the uh, fermion propagator, right? It's the, the fermion spectral uh, function you're looking at. Um, and what you, let me see, I'm just circling a bit with the, yeah, here we are. What you see here is you're very doping, right? Um, and then at these high energies, you see this very drastic sudden change here. But this is in a response function. That's my point. My point is that a discontinuity in a response function does not necessarily imply a first order Excuse transition. Me. Maybe, you know, you may have an holographic answer to my question, uh, which would be great. I'm just saying the holographic answer is the feeling uh, principle as we know it. It doesn't matter as a response function. This thing is actually measuring the way that the world works at these high energies. It tells you how the electrons bounce back and forth, right, at an energy of, you know, 0 0.1, 0 0.2 electron volts, which is a lot of energy, right? You see that uh, um, at these high energies, the electrons really bounce uh, uh, very differently uh, uh, when you're just below the, uh, Critical dopamine and just above the critical dopamine. And now comes the statement. This has nothing to do with whether you have response function or uh, anything. When you do your uh, classical matter, you can use your standard Wilsonian renormalization group. Why do you say, I have a short distance physics that is suddenly jumping in the first order fashion? And now I uh, uh, follow my renormalization group flow, I will invariably find a runaway flow that is that is amplifying this discontinuity. When you have an example where no longer you can demonstrate that this runaway flow is not happening, I'd say if you were a microscopic sudden change, there's actually shrinking and healing when you go to larger distances. I would dearly like to know it because this is the puzzle. I'm just saying in conventional physics, it won't ever happen. In holography, it may happen. Okay, I see. Maybe see we should it, discuss right? this yeah, offline. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, perhaps, you know, we can have a further chat about it, Elios, because I'm really curious where you see this happen in holography. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, you say it, right? because you may have an answer here. Please, uh, give no, 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 I, I, I mean, the model, yes. the model that I've seen it happening is a model that resembles very much uh, standard QCD in the Veneziano limit. And this is a phenomenon that happens near the conformal phase transition. Conformal phase transition is known in these theories already from the, I mean, it was suspected already from the one of Son and collaborators and um, uh, in explicit models, in fact, people managed to realize it in holography that it's an infinite order transition. But we calculated the specific uh, correlation <coughs> function, which is important for particle physics. And we found it to be discontinuous which is something usually you don't expect. I'm just telling you, right, that it should not happen in normal matter. Okay, you do a lot of blah, blah, and that may happen, right? Because it's this dense entailed matter, blah, blah, and there may be different rules out there. I'm just saying when you do your standard Wilsonian job, it will never happen. And it doesn't matter whether you have an infinite order or, or a second order to assist you, you know, it's just a principle, right, that the, uh, the change in physics, don't think response function, response function just are probing that physics out there, uh, right? When you have a microscopic sudden change, it will always be bigger when you go to longer distances, point, runaway flow, sitting there in standard RG. And that, that, that you're violating is very interesting, right?
Okay. You should uh, talk more about it, Elliot, because I really would like yeah, to know okay. a bit more detail. Uh, you may have the answer. I think Elias is done with his question. So we are clearly over time, but if there is time maybe for a last question, if somebody wants to ask. <laughs> it seems that no one. So let's, it was very nice talk, Jan. Thank you very I hope much. I appreciate this. And you have now more energy. You and Logophys are very important people. Yeah, it was very much. <laughs> my strong opinion. Uh, you earn me apartments in China, unfortunately, I don't have a job there. So. <laughs> okay, <laughs> very well. Okay, then I think that that's all. Let me just say that the next talk is this Friday at 10 European time. So um, it's, it's going to be hard for Americans, but good for Asia. By Lily, who was here in the audience, I don't know if he's still there, from Beijing. And then also Luca, who spoke just, just a bit ago, is going to speak next Thursday. And as I, I wrote uh, in, the, in the chat, you have there the link of to the Holotube page where you, you find all the talks and also there will be recordings. And you can also ask questions. There is a forum for discussion or proposed talks or a lot of things. So thanks everyone. And I think that's all. And thanks especially to you, Jan. Nice. Yeah, okay, it was kind of fun to do this virtual seminar. I felt more <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I think we yeah, It was more. very nice. I'm happy you liked it. Okay, see you guys. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you, everyone. Bye.